matter how good you are at executing a build order, there will come a time in which this doesn't win you the game. If you're playing against an evenly matched opponent and both of you are making the same number of good plays, then eventually you'll find yourselves in the late game. Since not many games actually make it to the late game, you're likely lacking in experience for this situation. Of course, your opponent probably also lacks experience, so even if you don't know what you're doing, you can still sometimes win the game. Now, imagine if you did actually know what you were doing in the late game. You might be able to increase your chances of victory simply by not dying throughout the game. Normally, understanding what you should prioritize takes thousands of games. Luckily for you, I've played those thousands of games and have developed a pretty strong late game due to playing at least a thousand games with Byzantines alone. Since there's a lot less structure in the late game, your priorities are much broader. You're not doing things like making your economy perfect for supporting two range archers anymore. Now, your focus is on securing resources and keeping your villager count high. You're not thinking, oh, I have five archery range producing arbalists and one castle producing trebs and five barracks producing halves, so I need 33 on wood, 33 on gold, and 27 on food. No, it's more like, I see gold, I want. I send half of the villagers at a wood line to go take it. Your mental resources are much more limited in the late game, so prioritization is the key to being successful. If you focus on the wrong things, you will lose. The 10 tips that I'm presenting here are very common and you will potentially need to think about all of them in a single game. So let's get started. In early Imperial Age, you should have a plan for where your resources are being invested into. Oftentimes you're not fully boomed yet, so keeping your villagers producing makes sense. The thing is, sometimes you need that food for technologies such as Bracer or Halberdier, so it can be worth stopping villager production temporarily to afford these techs. The most important thing about going to Imp, and really any age, is to know exactly what you want to get in the next age. Are you going for Trebs? Make sure to have 200 wood and 200 gold per castle when you're up. Are you going Arb? Save 600 food for Bracer and Chemistry. Are you going Halb? Make sure you have enough barracks to support good unit production and save 300 food and 600 gold for the upgrade. For Cavalier, same thing. Make sure to have enough stables and save enough resources to click Cavalier and Plate Barding Armor as soon as you reach Imp. Getting these Imperial Age techs as soon as you can and then attacking as soon as they're in is the last big power spike of the game. If you miss the timing, you may be doomed to play Trash Wars for the next two hours. As a general rule, you want to be pushing with Imperial Age Siege in early Imperial Age, which leads us to the next tip. When deciding whether to get Conscription or Trebuchets, there are a few things to consider. First, let's talk about what exactly Conscription does. It increases the work rate of barracks, archery ranges, stables, and castles by 33%. This means that these buildings train units and research technologies faster. The biggest cost for this tech is not the actual resources cost, but the amount of time it takes to research. It only costs 150 food and 150 gold, which is very little at this stage of the game. The fact that it takes 60 seconds to research is why you need to consider if it's worth getting before your initial trebuchets. Let's look at some situations where you'd want trebs and some where you'd want conscription. Many times, you'll want both as soon as possible, but we'll need to choose one over the other. Trebuchets are a huge power spike versus an opponent in Castle Age, so it can be a good idea to make them right away if an enemy castle is near one of your castles in the case of a castle drop. Actually, going up to imp fast for trebuchets by stopping villager production is one of the best ways to stop an enemy castle drop. If you're up to Imperial Age faster, then assembling your trebuchets faster will let you push without the opponent being able to stop it. If the opponent is pushing your castle with trebuchets and you don't have army to dive under his castle in the case that you went cavalry archers, making your own trebs to shoot down the opponent's trebs can be a good play, especially if you're Huns. Just make sure to repair your castle and trebs when they take damage. If you aren't in a position to push an opponent's castle right away, then going conscription first can help build up an army to push at a later time. There's no point in making trebs first if you can't protect them if you were to go for a push. Assemble your core military first and then go for trebs later. When you decide to move out, don't just go with one treb. Wait until you have three or four so your opponent won't have time to get into position to repair. This mainly applies when you're pushing enemy territory out of your own castle range. Building a forward castle to support your trebuchets can be very useful in this situation. Or you can save your stone to put a castle in the same spot as the enemy castle once you take it down. Some games, you don't even need to build trebs. If your plan is to go for rams or bombard cannons, then you can probably get conscription right away. Another case in which you might not need trebs right away is when you're making cavalier or champions. 
those units can run under castle fire without taking too much damage, so sometimes you can use them to pick off enemy trebs and even take out an enemy castle. If you have two castles on imp, then you can usually use the back castle for conscription and the forward castle for trebs. It can also be useful to build one treb in the back castle before getting conscription in it. By the time the one treb gets to the front line, you'll have two out of the forward castle, which can really help to push faster. In summary, if you're ready to push right away on imp, get trebs. If you need units or don't need trebs, get conscription. You should always get conscription at some point, so even if you do go for trebs first, you should get conscription directly afterwards. Next on the list is finish your important unit upgrades before investing into another unit. Having two partially upgraded units often loses to one fully upgraded unit. For example, if you're going Cavalier and you see the opponent is going Arbalester, make sure to get Cavalier upgrade and at least plate Barding Armor before investing into Skirmishers. Another example is if you want to start raiding with Hussar. Don't invest all of your food into them before you've finished at least their armor upgrades, bloodlines, and husbandry. If you're in Imperial Age but you only have Castle Age upgrades for your units, you'll not be taking very cost-effective trades a lot of the time. Another thing to keep in mind when upgrading your units is that they almost all benefit from upgrades found in their production building. If you're going for infantry, double-check that you have Squires and Arson. If you're going Arb or Cavalry Archers, Thumbring is extremely important. Cavalry Archers also need Parthian tactics for extra Pierce Armor and bonus damage against Spearmen. This one's pretty easy to forget, as it's an Imperial Age tech. For Cavalry, Bloodlines and Husbandry will almost always be researched in Castle Age, but it's still worth it to check. And finally, if your Civ has a unique tech that benefits your units such as Magyar's Recurve Bow for Cavalry Archers, you need to check the castle as well to make sure that you got it. This is kind of related as well. At some point, ideally after you've clicked Imp, double check that you have Bow Saw and Heavy Plow. A good time to get Handcart is on the way to Imp, so get that in one of your town centers that's not researching Imp. Also, select your mining camp to see if you have at least the first mining upgrades. Sometimes gold shaft mining is worth it at this point, but stone shaft mining is rarely worth it. On Imperial Age, you gain access to two man saw and crop rotation. Two man saw can be worth it after you're done spending your food on unit upgrades, but crop rotation takes too long to pay off normally. If you think the game is going to last another 40 minutes, then yeah, crop rotation can be good, but usually you'd rather spend those resources elsewhere. I mentioned earlier that in Imp your priorities change. This is one of those changes. Throughout the game, you might find it worth it to raid with some of your military, even though those units will definitely get cleaned up. Villager kills earlier in the game are worth a lot more than later. Conversely, your gold units are worth a lot more later in the game when gold starts to dry up. Throwing 15 knights to kill 20 villagers in Castle Age can win the game for you, while throwing 15 cavalier to kill 20 villagers once Imperial Age is in is rarely a good idea. This isn't even just because gold is running out. A lot of the time splitting your army in imp means the enemy gets to defeat two half-size armies with their full army. Getting 20 villager kills barely hurts the opponent when they're full boomed, and those villagers will be replaced before you can replace your army. If you want to raid with gold units, it can be best to send just a few cavalier and split them well, or just a few arbalists to sit behind a woodline. Your focus at this stage should be assembling a big army that you can push the middle with. If your main force is only at half strength, then you'll probably lose it. On a related note, if you still have a good number of gold units when the opponent only has trash, do your best not to trade evenly cost-wise with the trash units. If you have Cavalry Archers or Arbs, avoid fighting Skirmishers without a Meat Shield in front. If you have Cavaliers, keep them away from Halbs, as you'll just waste them. If you have Onagers, protect them from Hussars with Halbadiers. If the game gets to post-imp Trash Wars, you really need to keep your Gold Units alive. A few Gold Units peppered in makes very little difference, but if you can keep units alive and build up numbers using Gold you've gained from Relics and the Market, you can eventually go for another strong push that can't be stopped with Trash Units alone. The unit that excels the most in Trash Wars is the Champion. It has enough Pierce Armor that Skirmishers are not an effective counter to them, and its other stats allow it to shred through Halberdiers and Hussars. The most effective counters are Arbalist, Cav Archers, Hand Cannons, and Cavalier, all of whom cost considerably more gold. For the ranged units, they need to be massed as well since one or two of them is not going to stop a bunch of Champions. 
For Cavalier, champions will trade decently in the late game, and it's usually easy enough to add in some halberdiers with your champions if the Cavalier numbers get out of control. Adding your own skirms to deal with the ranged counters to champions is what you do a lot of the time, so really, this is why champions reign supreme in Trash Wars. They cost only a little gold, aren't countered by any of the three normal trash units, and can take down buildings so you don't need siege that's just gonna die to Hussar or something. Any Civ that has a unique infantry unit can usually substitute the champion for it, as they are most likely just like a champion with extra stats. Of course, you need castles to produce unique units, so you may be limited by this. If you want to win the Trash War and your Civ has good champions, it's wise to start investing into their upgrades just before gold runs out. You can still sustain unit production of champions with just a few relics, so as long as you get the upgrades out of the way, mixing in champions when you can will usually help in Trash War situations. This also leads into the next tip. Take relics if you haven't started by late Castle Age. If you can't win the game with your early imp push, there's a good chance the game will go on for a while. For this, you'll want to take relics, if only so your opponent doesn't get them. Each relic is equivalent to one villager with gold shaft mining. So, if you get all five relics, it's as if you have five villagers that don't take up population space working on a gold mine that never runs out. Sounds good and all, but what can you actually buy with this relic gold? Five relics keep two barracks constantly producing champions even after conscription. After 80 seconds, you get 200 gold which you can use to produce one trebuchet with. Just one relic gives you 30 gold per minute, which is enough to buy 200 wood or food per minute at bottomed out prices. If you're going for an economic approach to Castle Age, i.e. when you're 3TC as opposed to 1TC, taking relics as part of your strategy will often pay off. Once you have sufficient food income to support your 3TCs, spending the next 175 wood on a monastery won't disrupt your economy at all. Food sufficiency for 3 town centers is 16 farmers with wheelbarrow or 18 farmers without. Securing the relics can be difficult if you don't have map control. If the enemy is attacking you, you should prioritize stopping this before taking relics. Since relics take a while to pay off, keeping your monks at home for healing and conversions can be better in this situation. Any resource not invested into pushing the opponent back increases the chance of you losing more in the long run as your opponent invests more into his army. Even one conversion can change the result of a battle, so sending just one monk to bring in relics is sometimes not worth the risk if you need to defend. After mid castle age, when both players are thinking about imp, is when you should really consider taking relics if you haven't already. At this point, the relative investment of resources is not as much, and if one player doesn't lose an early imp, the game could go on for another hour or more. Some civilizations such as Lithuanians, Aztecs, Burgundians, and Indians have bonuses that they get from relics, so taking relics as soon as it makes sense to do so should be part of their game plan. If you're up against one of these civs, taking map control and watching over the relics is another thing you can keep in mind. Other civs that benefit a lot from having relics are civs that have a strong late game but weaker early game such as Byzantines and Portuguese. In addition to this, civs with weak trash units such as Vikings and Franks should try to get relics so they can continue to add in gold units in post-imp. A key part of winning the late game is raiding, and a key part of losing the game is being raided. When you get raided, even if you do everything right, you have a castle in your economy, maybe some halberdiers running around, you still end up losing some villagers. After cleaning up a raid, you have to make sure to send your villagers back to work. It's at this point that you also need to replace lost villagers. While you still have gold, if you're going cavalier, getting up to 130 villagers is about right to keep yourself near max population quickly after each fight. If you're going arbalester, closer to 110 villagers is fine. If you drop below 100 villagers at any point in imp, it's often worth it to add a few more town centers to help repopulate your villager count. Extra town centers on the map can help you save villagers against future raids, and the actual cost of the building isn't that much at this stage. The issue with losing villagers in the late game is that you won't be able to maintain your max population army as you're constantly fighting. Even just the fact that you need to invest some of your food into villagers can mean that you can't continue to spam trash. What you need is time in order to get your villager count back to a reasonable level. The question then becomes, how do I buy time until my villager count has recovered? There are three ways to buy time in this situation. The most obvious is to go raid the opponent so he also has to replace lost villagers. 
This will only work if you already have a raiding unit, such as Hussar or Champion upgraded. You also aren't guaranteed to do damage, so throwing units could just make your situation worse. This knowledge can also be used from the other point of view. If you raided the enemy first, secure your base so you can secure your advantage. If raiding isn't an option, but you have speedy units such as Hussar or Cavalier, picking off enemy siege units can really stall a push. Without trebuchets or bombard cannons, it can be really difficult to push castles. This can at least buy enough time until the opponent has more siege on the field. The third option is to give up ground until you max out. If you let your opponent destroy all your buildings on the front, sometimes this gives you enough time to max out your population so you can push them back. If you're losing production buildings and houses, then you need to make sure to replace them further back in your base. The most important thing to do here is not lose army and set your rally points to the back of your base. You must patiently watch your front get destroyed while you max out. If you can max out on 100 military while your opponent has only 80 since their villager count is a healthier 120, there's a much better chance of you being able to push back. As you lose some of your military here, you should continue villager production back up to 110 to 120 as this will let you maintain max pop more easily while constantly fighting. As the player taking ground in this situation, you shouldn't get overconfident as if the opponent hasn't resigned yet, they're probably preparing a maxed out army to push you back. Securing hills and supporting your trebs with castles can help you keep your push alive if your opponent has more military than you. This is a fact that's worth exploring further, though I've covered most of it in my Constructing Buildings Intelligently video. Castles can either be something that completely secures an area, or something that's a complete waste of resources. Let's start with the most obvious consideration for castle placement. Castles on a hill do more and take less damage from units on a lower elevation. When possible, you should plan to have your castle on top of a hill. Sometimes this is not possible. In these cases, you should ensure that your castle is not going to be sieged from atop a hill. Place your castle far enough away from a hill that it's out of range of enemy trebuchets and bombard cannons that are on a hill. You'd rather fight on flat ground versus flat ground than fight uphill. Another attribute of a good castle is that it secures resources. This could mean being in your main base to protect farmers from raids, or out on the map to protect woodlines or neutral gold and stones. Even just being able to garrison villagers inside for protection can buy you enough time for your army to finish cleaning up the raids. Building a castle on a central hill will give you a good attack path towards the enemy's base while also forcing the opponent to attack uphill versus you to push you off. Controlling the center means your opponent can't easily reinforce armies that are attacking the sides, so it's easier for you to just send everything to the center and clean up wherever the opponent is attacking. This really leaves your opponent with two options invest everything into pushing uphill into mid, or send raids to kill villagers. If you secure your base and fortify the center, you will be in a very good position. It's when you step down from that hill to push deeper into the opponent's base that you may throw the game. Eventually, you'll need to move your siege out of the protection of your castle to push further. In this case, building another castle on the flat ground to help secure more area can be good. Just make sure to remember the earlier point of being out of range of other hills so you don't get trebbed from the high ground. Real quick, I'll go over some bad castle placements, so if you avoid doing these, you'll probably be alright. Don't place a random castle outside your opponent's base in the late game, unless you're going to push from there right away. It's not like in the early game where killing a few villagers or denying a gold mine has a huge impact. More often than not, your opponent will just treb you down for free. Don't place your castle too close to the edge of the map. You won't secure as many resources and you won't limit the opponent's army movement as much. There are rare instances where this is okay though. If the only high ground available to push the enemy is a castle right up against the edge of the map, then it can be fine. As I went over earlier, don't place your castle below a hill that your opponent controls. You're just asking to lose it for free if you place it there. The final bad castle placement I'll mention here is in the middle of nowhere. Even if your castle's on a hill, if it doesn't secure resources or block attack paths, then there's no point in building it there. A common issue in the late game is floating wood and food. Your first response might be to get a market and sell it, but there are other things you can use it for a lot of the time. Upgrades such as siege engineers, masonry, and architecture all only cost wood and food, so make sure to pick these up if you're floating these resources. For your wood, adding production buildings until you have roughly 10 of the ones you're using can be good before you sell it. There is another perspective to spending your wood and food in the late game though. 
If the prices at the market aren't bottomed out, you may decide to sell before your opponent can. This can help a lot if you aren't able to secure enough gold in early imp to afford your initial maxed out army. The best time to sell all of your food and wood can be after you've maxed out and the prices are still decent. Even though you're not getting a great exchange rate by selling hundreds of food and wood for only 50 or less gold, since gold is about to become really scarce, it can keep you pumping gold units for just a little longer than your opponent, so it can sometimes be just enough for you to snowball a victory. If you're still floating food and wood and you're not maxed out, chances are you're not spamming enough trash. You may need more production buildings or maybe you forgot conscription. Another explanation is that you're just forgetting to queue units. If you're floating food and wood and you are sitting at max pop, you really need to be fighting the enemy so you can spend on more units. If you max out without siege, it can be hard to push, so do your best to remember to add at least 3 trebs before maxing out. At some point, setting a bunch of stables rally points into your opponent's economy and just queuing 3 million hussar is a viable way to spend through your food. You'll constantly be forcing your opponent's attention to his economy, so you can push the front with siege a lot easier. Sometimes your Hussar raids can just kill the opponent as well if they aren't able to defend properly. Hussar raids should almost always be part of your late game game plan if you're a Civ that has good Hussar. Folding food and wood is inevitable in some games that go super late. If you're in a stalemate situation, sometimes you can break it by floating 4000 food and 4000 wood and then deleting down to around 80 or 90 villagers which will give you a bit of an army advantage which will hopefully allow you to push for a while against inferior numbers. If you do this strategy, it's important to replace your villagers when you start getting low on resources, otherwise you won't be able to maintain your massive army count. Just like the tip when getting raided, if you delete villagers, make sure to add extra town centers so you can replace them later. Having 5 or more town centers is just about right. Let's think back a bit to that early to late imp transitional period. Let's say that you chose Magyars and played knights in Castle Age. On Imp, it makes sense to upgrade those knights into Cavalier and then continue making them as the core of your army. Anytime you have Trebs in the queue, the rest of your gold goes into Cavalier. You're just about ready to attack when you see the opponent has Halberdier. You know that if you go for an attack now, you'll just lose everything to Halbs. Luckily for you, you remember that Magyars have fully upgraded Arbalisters, so you start tacking into those. This delays your push by a lot, but you figure it's worth it, otherwise you'll just lose everything anyways. So, you go to push out again, and this time you see your opponent has added in Onagers with Siege Engineers. Well, you're maxed out now, so you decide that your army isn't getting any stronger, so you might as well go in and see what you can do. You clash armies and realize that your Arvlisters all died super easily to the Onagers, and Cavalier melted to the Halves before you could clean them up. After the fight, you think about what to do next. If Arb and Cavalier, which are supposedly the ultimate composition won't do the trick, then what will? You remember seeing a pro game where one of the players went Cav Archers and Hussar and you realize that with Recurve Bow and Corvinian Army, you have some of the best Cav Archers and Hussar in the game. So you start building up your new and improved army of Magyar Hussar and Heavy Cavalry Archers. You get the Heavy Cavalry Archer upgrade, Recurve Bow, Corvinian Army, and Elite Magyar Hussar, and then go to Q units. You have no trouble keeping your castles running since you have tons of food, but for some reason your archery ranges aren't working. You check your gold count and see that you've completely run out. Easy fix, you think to yourself, I'll just send more villagers to gold. You find some slackers in your base and select them. Then you check your main gold, depleted. You check your second gold, also depleted. You look around for your third gold, again depleted. The panic starts to settle in as you realize you've made a huge mistake. By not committing to an army composition early on, you've spent all of your available gold on upgrades that you can't even use. By this time, the opponent is pushing you hard, and the only unit that you can produce is the Magyar Hussar, which just dies to the enemy halberdiers. As the game continues, you start losing castles, and your production slows to a halt. At this point, you realize the game is lost, and you tap out. In this scenario, you can see that by not committing to just one core gold unit, you won't be able to create enough of each unit to justify upgrading them. Good unit compositions tend to have one gold and one trash unit as the core of the army with either rams or trebuchets and bombard cannons to push buildings. This ensures that you have enough gold to fully upgrade all of your units and gives you enough gold left over to keep your core gold unit and siege pumping for a while. Usually one of your core units should be ranged and the other melee, for example cavalry archers and hussar or arbalister and halb. 
Sometimes double melee compositions can work, such as Paladin Halberdier and Champion Hal, but double ranged compositions tend to die to cavalry, as they rely on that meat shield in front to soak up all the damage. Ranged units are also extremely bad at killing rams, so in some cases, bad trash is better than no trash. This is commonly seen in the case of Britons adding light cavalry with no bloodlines to keep the enemy from reaching their archers. In order to stay on track with your core gold unit in the late game, you must consider the Civ matchup and think about what units the opponent will likely go for so you can make the right decision for where to invest your resources. One more thing, Cavalier is the gold unit that will eat through your gold the fastest. Once the opponent has Halberdiers, you need to have a unit to deal with them before making too many Cavalier. Once the game becomes Trash Wars, adding in a Cavalier here and there is a huge waste of gold. It's better to use your gold on other things like trebuchets or champions. This means that Cavalier often have a small window of usefulness after reaching Imp, so make sure to get your upgrades quickly so you can hit that timing attack as soon as possible. The final tip of this video is don't lose morale. Even if you're being pushed hard from the front, you can use this knowledge that you've learned here to plan your comeback. The late game is as much a battle of endurance as it is a battle of strategy and execution. If you stop microing properly and your macro gets sloppy, then you'll definitely lose. If you keep trying until there's really no hope, then you'll at least have gained valuable late game experience, regardless of if you ended up winning. So if you're getting pushed, fall back, take relics, keep the vill count up, sneak in an expansion, max out, and push back. If it fails, then at least you did what you could before resigning. You should take every chance that you can get to gain experience in the late game, so even if you're winning, expand your economy outwards, take relics, add production buildings, max out before attacking, raid the enemy, secure areas with castles, and do whatever else we went over in this video. If you think the game is over and you stop trying, this gives the opponent time to come back. Don't show any mercy, only stop when he's dead. And that's it for this one. Hopefully this video has given you thousands of hours worth of experience for playing the late game. Now, go out there and Civ pick Byzantines, and I'll see you in the Imperial Age.